Good afternoon, I'm Pete Peterson, the very grateful Dean of Pepperdine's Graduate School of Public Policy, and I am delighted to welcome you here to the 2022 Charles and Rosemary Licata Lecture, our first lecture in two years. Great to have you back. This is always one of the highlights of the academic calendar, and as you see from the uh, lecture brochures that are at your table, uh, this lecture has welcomed a number of leading scholars and policymakers to the stages here at Pepperdine's Graduate Policy School over the years, and we will certainly be continuing that tradition with Dr. McClay today. Before we get into the program, I did want to recognize a few of our distinguished guests. First, I want to make sure that uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, that you get a chance to meet some of our graduate policy students here. For the students, could you raise your hand who are with us today? Thank you. Future leaders. Also want to recognize uh, from the university, our chancellor is joining us here today, Sarah Jackson. We also have board members here today. We have a, uh, an advisory board to the School of Public Policy. And so uh, we have Gary Oakland with us today, one of our board members. Maureen Grace, one of our board members here as well. And our newest board member, Lisa Smith-Wengler, is here today. But I want to make sure that we reserve this time to thank the person that has made, uh, not only today, but this lecture series over the decades possible. And so will you please join me in thanking Rosemary Licata, who's here today with her sister Beatrice. Rosemary, for those of you who know, is a force of nature and a force for good. And I couldn't be more grateful to have uh, her name on this lecture series, but also your friendship, Rosemary. You've been, you and Beatrice have been such a great encouragement to me and supporters of the School of Public Policy. Uh, now, as we step into our 25th anniversary year, and so thank you. Well, let's get on with our program, because I could not be more excited to welcome back to the Malibu campus a longtime friend of the School of Public Policy, Dr. Bill McClay. As you've seen in the brochure and material, his background, uh, Dr. McClay is currently the Victor Davis Hanson Chair at Hillsdale College. Before that, he served uh, and taught with distinction at uh, University of Oklahoma, before that, University of Tennessee at Chattanooga. But he has served twice as a visiting professor here at the School of Public Policy, first as our Simon Visiting Professor in 2009-2010, and then as our Ronald Reagan Distinguished Professor in 2019-2020. It is not too much to say that Dr. McClay is really one of the great patriots in America today, one of the great voices in defending the American experiment against what can only be described as withering attacks in our classrooms and in the public square. I hope you've all had a chance to pick up his uh, amazing textbook slash casual reading book, uh, Land of Hope. Um, we are reading this in the Peterson household, uh, my wife Gina and I with our 10-year-old uh, daughter Elsa, who is also joining us here today. Um, Bill is such an incredible writer, and that's important when you're telling the story of American history. I wanted to read to you just from the last paragraph of this book, which for those of you who haven't read this, will give you a sense of Bill's amazing talent in telling the story of this incredible nation. I quote, 
The patriotism that the United States has brought into being is one of the bright lights of human history, and we should not allow it to be extinguished, either through inattention to our ideals or through ignorance of our story. So we have a responsibility before us. We must know both, not only our creed, but also our culture. We need to take abroad fully all that was entailed in our forebears' bold assertion that all human beings are created equal in the eyes of the Creator, and that they bear an inherent dignity that cannot be taken away from them. But we also need to remember and teach others to remember the meaning of Lexington and Concord, and Independence Hall, and Gettysburg, and Promontory Summit, and Point de Hoc, and Birmingham, and West Berlin, and countless other places and moments of spirit and sacrifice in the American past, places and moments with which the American future will need to be conversant and will need to keep faith. You could describe the School of Public Policy in many ways, but I could describe it in this context and in this way. The School of Public Policy is here to keep faith with our founders. And through events like this one and in our classrooms, uh, we are here to not only engage in the history of America as some sort of historical experiment, but as Bill says, to understand why we need to know these things for the current policy and political debates that we're seeing and the ones that we'll be engaging with and our students will be engaging with in the years to come. This book and Bill's work in telling the American story and to engage in that work in America's classrooms could not be more timely. And so today, as he gives his lecture on the Constitution, one of the things I think is so important about his work, and you'll hear it in this talk today, is that the Constitution is not simply a document for organizing a government, in this case, the United States government. The United States Constitution is in many ways a philosophical document that understands the appropriate role for citizens and governing institutions. And so in this sense, the Constitution is not so much a way of understanding the roles of the federal and state government and the three branches and so forth. It is a way of understanding how citizens and governing institutions interact with one another in a way that promotes self-governance. This is why it's important to understand the history and the founding, again, not so much to understand these as things that happened centuries ago, but understand that we are still having these debates today, because these are human debates, and why a voice like Dr. McClay's is so important. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming our 2022 Lakata lecturer, Dr. Bill McClay. Well, it's wonderful to be home again, and uh, uh, what a beautiful home it is. Thank you, Pete, for that. And I, there's something I want to say before I get any further, is that I'm sitting at the same table with a founder, as a founder who, with whom Pete's deanship has kept faith uh, admirably, but the, the person who got this School of Public Policy rolling, Jim Wilburn, and I think we should give him yeah. a round of applause. <laughs> Um, I also, as I came in, uh, Melissa and Pete gave me a, a present that I'm wearing. It's a 25th <laughs> anniversary vest, and so if you don't mind, I'm going to just take this. Okay, so this is a sort of a casual style you know, tie and sweatshirt, you know, like, only in California. <laughs> Okay, I, I want to come into this subject about the Constitution and why teaching the Constitution is an important part of 
civic education a little bit obliquely. And I want to do it by talking about uh, Queen Elizabeth. That's pretty oblique. Um, but she's been on our minds uh, lately, uh, not just because of her health, uh, but because uh, she is now the longest reigning monarch in uh, British history. Uh, she actually long ago surpassed Victoria's 63 years. Uh, and just a few weeks ago, we celebrated her 70th, her platinum anniversary uh, of her ascension to the throne. Uh, 70 years as queen. Uh, her achievement was celebrated in the American media, uh, partly because we Americans are fascinated by her. We're fascinated, we have a fondness for this particular queen uh, and the royal family more generally. Just why is that? Why are we fascinated by the royal family, by the monarch? It seems a very strange way to behave for a country that came into being through a revolution against one of Elizabeth's predecessors. Not to mention being a country whose constitution, the 235th anniversary of which we're being about to celebrate this year, this September, incorporates the principle that no title of nobility, quote unquote, no title of nobility would be granted in the United States and every state in the Union is to have a Republican form of government, which it doesn't mean big R Republican, it means no kings, queens, dukes, etc. allowed. So there are probably more elements to this particular puzzle than there's time to elucidate today, and I don't want to put you all to sleep. Uh, but part of the answer surely lies in the bonds between our two nations. Uh, shared language, shared customs and laws and culture, our country may have been born in rebellion, but our constitution's form and contents are indebted to the British precedents that uh, shaped it, especially following the long series of struggles for power during the 17th century, eventuating in the Glorious Revolution and the arrangements therein, which have pretty much uh, persisted. More generally, this, the special relationship between the two nations and, it, and the enduring bonds, despite our occasional differences, uh, are, are there. Uh, there can be no doubt about it that we Americans have a rooting interest in the well-being of this queen. But there's something else at work, too, and this is beginning to wend toward my topic. The queen's most important role in her country is an impersonal one. Her office as a disinterested and transpartisan symbol of the United Kingdom and the Commonwealth. Those of you who've seen the dramatic television series called The Crown about the life of Elizabeth, at least the first season, I, I don't really go for the, the subsequent seasons, but the first season. <laughs> Those of you who've seen this will have seen what that means and how it meant paying a very great price, personal price for her to be that symbol. But she's nevertheless performed her assigned role with a superlative grace. She's arguably, and I would argue this, the single most compelling symbol of political stability and unity in today's world, bar none. Despite all the changes of British society since 1952, when she ascended to the throne, the transformation of the country's demography, its economy, and the collapse of its world, wide empire and, and influence. Beside, despite all of that, her matronly yet commanding presence reassures his people and those of us who care about them, which I think probably includes everybody in this room, that the essential things carry on uh, year in and year out. There's something really enviable in this. We Americans often feel the absence of such unifying personal symbols in our own contentious nation, and many of us yearn for them, especially at the present moment when so much in our national life seems so contested, the presidency itself, no matter who occupies it, seems more often a source of division than a source of unity. Seeming to lack the symbols of unity, we fear we may be losing the thing itself. It's not an unjustified fear. 
But in fact, we do not lack for unifying symbols if we're willing to avail ourselves of them. Ever since George Washington gallantly refused the office of monarch, we've been on a different path, a path on which our commitment to impersonal laws and impartial procedures overrides our commitment to any one man or woman as our symbolic head. For us, it is a document, our Constitution, that plays the role of democratic monarch for us and thereby serves as a chief and most durable symbol of our national unity and our commitment to one another as a nation. This was not an entirely new idea. It was already being pointed to by Thomas Paine in his influential uh, revolutionary era pamphlet called Common Sense, which probably most of you read somewhere along the line. Listen to his words. <clears throat> But where, say some, is the king of America? Capitalized, the king of America. Where, say some, is the king of America? I'll tell you, friend. He reigns above and doth not make havoc of mankind like the royal brute of Britain. That's George III, he's the king. Yet that we may not appear to be defective even in earthly honors, let a day be solemnly set apart for proclaiming the charter. Let it be brought forth, placed on the divine law, the word of God. Let a crown be placed thereon by which the world may know that so far as we approve of monarchy in America, the law is king. For as in absolute governments, the king is law. So in free countries, the law ought to be king, and there ought to be no other. Of course, he wasn't yet talking about the Constitution in 1776, but the principle is, uh, is the same one we're talking about. This kind of symbolic headship is not all the Constitution does, of course. In that sense, it's rather superior to Queen Elizabeth, uh, I, I will whisper. Uh, it is first and foremost a legal document, a written expression of the supreme law of the land, establishing the fundamental structure of the national government, delineating its relationship to state governments, explicitly protecting certain individual and collective rights over against the power of the national government. As such, it's not in any obvious way equivalent to a monarch. And like most legal documents, it's a rather dry affair. Unlike the Declaration of Independence, which has a resounding language, particularly in the preamble, it contains almost no stirring language proclaiming the idealism of its claims. But its symbolic function is a crucial part of what it has been for us. We've lived under its authority for the entire span of our nation's history, apart from a brief interlude under the Articles of Confederation. Hence, our national identity is difficult to conceive apart from it. To do so would mean to enter into utterly uncharted waters. By contrast, the French have through the centuries cycled through a multitude of regimes, monarchies, republics, empires, and yet French identity has never been reliant upon its existence for any particular form of government. We think of the United States as a young country, and perhaps we're right to do so. But the established life of the American nation has not existed apart from its constitution, which also happens to be the world's oldest constitution. So it's especially proper at a time of such intense contention in our national life to remember that and reflect on it. Of course, that doesn't mean that the constitution has always been a cause for celebration in everybody's mind. There have always been detractors, uh, people who are impatient with the Constitution's impediments to structural change. One of our most distinguished founders, Thomas Jefferson, was often dismissive of the Constitution's enduring importance. He mocked those who, and I quote, look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human. Yeah. <laughs> well, he was not entirely wrong in this attitude. The Constitution should not be treated as holy writ, complete and unalterable. The framers never intended that it should be. But Jefferson was wrong to disparage our instinct to venerate the Constitution. 
That's really the core of my talk. Uh, he was wrong to venerate, to, to, to disparage the tendency to venerate. And the fact that we've changed it so many ways since this time, improving it, <laughs> pattering it, elaborating on it, uh, deviating from it, doesn't change matters. We need our sprightly 234-year-old constitution now more than ever. We need it primarily as a foundational charter of our liberties and an organizational plan for a limited government. But we also need it as an anchor for our national life, a focal point of legitimacy in times of conflict. And I think an educative instrument to demonstrate to those who live under it the kinds of restraint that were required of a free people living under the law, the ways that our wants and desires as free citizens can be directed to make possible a good and orderly society. It's striking how often in times of national crisis, the debates that occur, and we used to have debates about things, <laughs> um, revolve around rival interpretations of the Constitution. Uh, just uh, in passing, I think of the Clinton impeachment. Uh, it was a wonderful kind of debate at that time over just what were high crimes and misdemeanors, what the, and uh, there were experts on both sides appeared before the House, quite passionate. But it was all a debate about how the Constitution would come down on this issue, not about whether the Constitution was legitimate or not. Um, so the right interpretation was in doubt, but the necessity of looking to the Constitution was presumed. As such, the Constitution must stand at the center of any civic education worthy of the name. It's a model whose example is felt in all the activities of American citizenship. It is admittedly a far less charming and personable object than Queen Elizabeth, and it lends itself poorly to occasions of pomp and ceremony. It just sits there. <laughs> under amber in the National Archives. But it's proven far more durable than any king or queen, and its health is a key to our unity and prosperity. Civic education, which is a big part of what we, we do, and I say we because I feel very much a part of this place. Uh, you know, that's why I wear this sweatshirt. <laughs> Civic education should serve the function of unlocking the secrets behind this great document's power to learn about the structures of the federal state government and understand in detail the elaborate system of checks and balances that thwarts our tendency towards excessive centralization of power. This does not need to be an exercise in dry road memorization. That's part of what I tried to do in Land of Hope is to make it vivid. Um, understood rightly, it's nothing less than a profound reflection on human nature, which is just what James Madison said in Federalist 51. It conveys the hard truth that given the flawed timber of human nature, a free and good society will always be a contentious society where interests collide with other interests and you, we need lawful rules of engagement to adjust and adjudicate these conflicts and strong institutions to embody that. Of course, not everyone agrees. <clears throat> One of the common arguments against the centrality of the Constitution in civic education is the fact of social pluralism in our society. In this view, an 18th century document written for an agrarian, decentralized society um, uh, of white Protestant English speakers could not possibly be adequate to the far more complex, increasingly diverse society in which we find ourselves today. And of course, LA County is sort of ground central for that uh, perception, that reality. Uh, what can the Constitution tell us about how to govern LA County? What can the Constitution tell us about issues like internet hacking or identity theft or surrogate parents or Oh, you know, you name it, uh, digital intellectual property. How does the study of the Constitution help us to think about these things? Well, you can take the argument even further. Perhaps the whole idea that there's a unified American nation with a national identity uh, is itself a delusion. Perhaps we're just too diverse today to think of ourselves in that way. If so, if that's true, then civic education can't be about 
the national commonalities that no longer exist. Instead, it's about the empowerment of subgroups and subcommunities and marginalized groups as a way of expanding the democratic ethos, a more perfect union. Uh, although where the unity is going to come from, is it's not, not exactly clear. But I'm trying to, to, to parrot uh, the line, of, actually I'm about to mention his name, of, of one of the political theorists who's, uh, who's uh, sort of opposed to the model of civic education that we embody here. So teaching the citizenry about these theories and structures of government is a waste of time. As the political theorist Peter Levine argues, uh, the essence of citizenship is activity. And you know, there's a lot to his arguments. It's not enough. But uh, the essence of citizenship is activity. The citizen is a person who asks the question, what should we do? And who then mobilizes to do it? This argument presumes a lot. It presumes in the first place that nothing is to be gained from referring our present day dilemmas to older principles and categories. But that's certainly not true. If anything, referring backward can help to clarify because it helps us to consider the particulars in light of larger and more abstract concepts. Questions of internet security are clarified by reference to the Fourth Amendment. Questions of big tech censorship are usefully developed by asking whether Google and Facebook and Twitter are common carriers in the common law sense of the term, and so on. It's a discipline of considering present day instances in light of more perennial features of human relations. Um, the argument, Levine's argument, also presupposes there is enough homogeneity in the present day society that we can have consensus about what it means to say something should be done and how you act lawfully in doing it. But the question of what should be done is not an empirical question. It's not. Should is not an empirical term. Should implies the introduction of values, of moral considerations. Uh, some conception of the moral universe that is behind our sense of shouldness. Um, the art of deliberation, too, is impossible without all set of prior commitments to principles of integrity and rationality and mutuality that don't arise spontaneously in human beings, as those of you with teenagers know, uh, but require education and shared values that are inculcated well in advance of the act of deliberating. This concept of action civics, which is something that Levine has associated himself with, is different. It presumes that civic education is kinetic, it's action. You learn to deliberate by the act of deliberating. You learn to make political judgments by the act of making political judgments. This isn't entirely wrong. And anybody who's here has served on a jury knows that there's some truth to it, that, that, that jury service is a powerfully educative experience. Uh, almost nobody I know would not attest to that, 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 that they're surprised at how uh, uh, ennobling that experience is. It would be a stronger example if it didn't apply exclusively to adults rather than children, uh, uh, and, and therefore to education. But you can't deliberate without having the moral and intellectual tools to do it. You can't gain those tools just by the act of trying to deliberate. Otherwise, you're going to be asking young people to engage in political action based entirely on what other people tell them to do, what they should do. So when high school students are being asked to participate in public demonstrations on behalf of, have a complex issues, climate change, open borders, tax policy, the proper role of the police, about which they cannot possibly have formed an independent and, and factual judgment. That is what's happening when you do that. These young people are being exploited as a cheap political labor force rather than being educated. That's a mockery of civic education. The question of cultural diversity, too, can lead in a very different direction than the exponents of this new civics take it. Samuel Goldman has written a very interesting book called After Nationalism, which says that 
the problem of, of, a, of a coherent national identity is sort of beyond us at the moment. And what we should do instead is strengthen our institutions of contestation, for most of which is the Constitution itself and the system of courts and, and other juridical bodies and other institutions that it forms, rather than chase the phantom of a cohesive culture. I actually don't agree with every element of his analysis, but I think he makes a very good point that uh, uh, what we should be doing is, uh, is, uh, is, is a very hard thing to determine. Uh, that could be that we, we should all be respecting those who think we should be doing something else and think we should leave them alone. Uh, but Goldman is right, I think, that a commitment to the institutional procedures of contestation, rules of evidence, right to counsel, and so on, uh, without insisting on particular substantive outcomes, is an important basis for holding a pluralistic society together. And that's exactly what the Constitution is about, is exactly about those functions. Um, and which I come back to my main point here. How is this respect? for our procedures to be maintained unless the Constitution itself is something to be venerated, something that brings respect to the government and contributes to its stability and endurance, something that provides a bond to connect the people to the nation, all the people. The Constitution's framers seem to incline to agree. Uh, consider these words of James Madison in Federalist 25. Wise politicians know that every breach of the fundamental law so dictated by necessity impairs that sacred reverence which ought to be maintained in the breast of rulers toward the constitution of a country and forms a precedent for other breaches where the same plea of necessity does not exist at all or is less urgent or palpable. If Madison's right, the dignity of the law should be understood as a seamless web for which an unattended tear in one area, especially of the highest and most general law, can present a more general loss of confidence in the law's efficacy and worth worthiness. A loss of reverence for the highest law in the land cannot help but under, undermine the way law and lawful behavior are understood on all levels. I don't think we're ready to go along with such a thin understanding of what it means to be an American citizen. It's unfortunate that the term citizenship has lost much of the noble luster it once had. It may have lost all meaning altogether in some quarters. Um, and civics is more than a user's guide to government. These are uh, words that ought to connote uh, something far beyond the mechanics of citizenship. They promote a vivid and enduring sense of belonging, that we belong to this enterprise together. We are in it together, this great enterprise, maybe the greatest enterprise in all human history of the story of our country. Both things involve fostering that sense of felt connection to the past that is so important. It ought to be a part of what we do in the classroom teaching history. I'm afraid it doesn't always happen, but um, it should happen. Therefore, although it's wildly unfashionable for me to say so, but I can be unfashionable here, right? I mean, I, 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 <laughs> I'm going to get some grief from a friend of mine for, who will see this um, video and let me know it's unacceptable. Okay. And she will, believe me. <laughs> but it's wildly unfashionable for me to say so, but civic education is an education in love. It's what it is. It's an education in love. Now, the love in question is not like any other love. It's not romantic love. It's not familial love. Uh, it's, it's something all its own. Um, and it, in common with all other forms of love, it can be imposed uh, by teachers or schools or government edicts, least of all in a free country. It has to be embraced freely. We have to be strong and mature enough to contend with the elements of disappointment and shame, criticism, dissent, failure, 
that are part of what, what we have been and what we will continue to be because we're fallible human beings. But it's love all the same. Love can perfectly exist, or at least it can exist, maybe not perfectly, <laughs> with a critical acknowledgement of faults and imperfections. This is not hard. This is really not that hard. Uh, we, don't we see the same coexistence every day in many of our most important relationships with other people? A lot of married people in this room, I'm sure, can, can, uh, can uh, go along with that. The highest love is not blind. It's not blind to imperfections and faults and the rest. But without encouraging the development of love for the nation, there will be less and less willingness on the part of citizens to make sacrifices for the invisible and anonymous, uh, anonymous others who make up the nation, whether on the field of battle or in the provision of health care or uh, the formulation of welfare policy. You see why this is an argument that ought to appeal to the left as well as the right. Uh, without that sense of the mystic chords of memory, as Lincoln said, it's very tempting to just see government as a dispenser of funds, a sort of vending machine for entitlements. Without the deeper foundations of love and memory, a people's sacrificial capacity will be exhausted soon, and the republic will perish. <clears throat> OK, I want to give it kind of wind up. I'm not quite there yet, but <laughs> uh, with a, a, a story, um, because I really believe in telling stories, and that stories can be uh, more illuminating than, uh, than propositional statements, so we can derive propositions from them. Um, so let me give a, a very concrete example of the Constitution's centrality in the thinking of a great American leader uh, who was, uh, it's an especially powerful example because I'm about to give away who it is. He was largely self-educated. Now you all know I'm talking about Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln, of course, was a voracious reader. He read everything he could get his hands on. He didn't get his hands on that much because printed materials were <laughs> scarce. Shakespeare and the King James Bible uh, apparently were among his great inspirations. You can sort of see that in his rhetoric. You know, four score and seven years ago, that's, that, that was the, that's the cadences of the King James Bible. It's not 87 years ago, but with that in time. So, so he had these, these influences, these great influences. Uh, I'm sorry to say he apparently didn't read very much history. Uh, <laughs> when he was a young man. But we did, he did read one book. Um, and it was about the first biography of George Washington, published actually in the year of his death by Mason Weems, or Parson Weems, he's sometimes called. And this is the account that's given us the fable of George Washington chopping down the cherry tree and saying he cannot tell a lie, and, you know, that sort of stuff. So it's generally, to these days, people say, scoff at... Uh, <laughs> at the mention of Parson Weems, but this book was actually very important to Abraham Lincoln, not because of the cherry tree either, because of something where, where Weems was accurate. And that has to do with the, the Revolutionary War. Um, the book stayed with Lincoln all his life. And how do we know this? We know because he told us so. February of 1861. Is remember the moment. Uh, he's, not, he's been elected president, first president in American history elected with absolutely no electoral votes in the South. So that in itself is, is giving rise to Southern movement towards Southern secession. And it's, you know, he's traveling from Springfield to Washington for his inaugural. The Southern states are dropping like flies. It's, there's real reason to think the nation is, is falling apart. And, um, and nobody knows quite what to do, whether to try to mollify the South further, whether to you know, gird their loins for war. It's, it's all up in the air. And what Lincoln will do is up in the air. Um, so he's on his way from Illinois to Washington to be inaugurated, this terrible moment. He stops off in Trenton, New Jersey, which, as, as people appreciate, it's not exactly a, a guard to spot, but uh, <laughs> okay. they have a, a sign on the bridge there that says, Trenton makes the world takes. And so, <laughs> what an, an inspiring way to grow up with that. I mean, the world is taking from you. <laughs> but 
and it was it was a sunnier place at that time, right? Yeah. Yeah. You all knew that he he has New Jersey. Uh, <laughs> we got it, Bill. Okay, I just wanted to be sure. Uh, so he stops off in New Jersey and gives us a couple of speeches to the two houses of the New Jersey legislature. And the one to the Senate was particularly, and they're very short speeches. Lincoln did the most wonderful short speeches. Um, he recalled the effect of the Weems book, the biography of George Washington, on, on him when he read it 40 years before as a young man. And he remembered Weems's account of the Battle of Trenton, of course, which was a turning point in the Revolution. And let me just read some for the speech here. And you'll get it, at my point. He says, I remember all the accounts there given of the battlefields and the struggles for the liberties of the country. And none fixed themselves upon my imagination so deeply as the struggle here in Trenton, New Jersey. Of course, Lincoln was a very good politician, you know. So, I mean, it'd be like me saying, here in Malibu, <laughs> the most important things in American history happen. But in this particular case, he's right. And listen to this, the crossing of the river, the contest with the Hessians, the great hardships endured at the time, all fixed themselves on my memory more than any single revolutionary event. And you all know, for you all have been children, how these early impressions last longer than any others. I recollect thinking then, boy though I was, that there must have been something more than common that these men struggled for. And he goes on to say, it was more than national independence. It was something that held out a great promise to all the people of the world for all time to come. And he concludes, I am exceedingly anxious that this union and the Constitution and the liberties of the people enshrined in it shall be perpetuated in accordance with the original idea for which the struggle was made. And he said some more things, but uh, it's a great speech. It's a very short speech. New Jersey State said you can find it online. But what a lot for a story to do for this young man who became the most, one of the most important leaders in our history. It shaped his mind. It shaped his soul in ways that would have consequences for all of us. These early impressions, these stories uh, would sustain him through the dark times to come. And his presidency was almost uninterrupted, dark days. Um, and the generation of 76, as he called it, the founding generation, the founders to which uh, we were to be faithful, the establishment of the Constitution, all these were ex explicitly in his speech. Um, so what, to conclude from this example, should we historians be writing nice little fables about, uh, no, of course not. Well, history has to be truthful. People are not going to buy it anymore if you give them a, a kind of saccharine view of American history. No better. They, they don't want that. But they want a history that's going to have a balance, a sense of balance to it, that does not rule out the magnificent achievements of our history. Um, leave them out of the account entirely as is too often becoming uh, the case. Uh, and, and I don't even need to give you examples of that. You know some of the things I'm talking about. So it's, it, this is one of the reasons we teach history. To the, it's a vessel of shared memory that gives each generation a sense of membership in their society, a sense of living connection to the past, something that unites them and sustains them in hard times. And one last Lincoln example. Um, Am I doing all right on time? OK. Lincoln brought the same connection to Barry in a lot of his speeches, but nowhere better than the Gettysburg Address, which I think you all know. I now make my students memorize the Gettysburg Address, because I think it's so, it, to memorize something is to make it your own. And uh, so I, I want to do that. And in Gettysburg, it, you know, the speech is all about uh, how keeping faith with a precious legacy the preservation of the deeds of the present uh, uh, should be, the pre present deeds should be dedicated to the recognition and the debt owed to those who had made sacrifices before. Um, I can say more about that, but I'm very conscious of running too much over time. But 
it can be that way for us too. Uh, we've lived through much worse times than the present. Much worse times. And, and, and some of us can remember those much worse times. Uh, Lincoln time was much worse. Uh, so we need to do this. Our young people need it. They deserve it. We are failing them and the country so long as we don't give them a rich and sustaining vision of their past. Um, <clears throat> consider the alternatives. If a story of magnificent, estimable things can give us courage and hope in a hard time, doesn't it stand to reason that a, a history of relentless failure and mendacity and despoilation of the environment and all that, uh, and without any sort of counterfailing uh, balance, can have the opposite effect. The inglorious story, I call it. The inglorious story of American history. That, that's a kind of civic education, too. Um, and why is it we're so solicitous of the safety, safety of our students? Not to hear something <gasps> that's going to upset them, that's going to trigger them, and, and all of that. Why don't we think about the effects of the inglorious story that we're telling them about our history? Doesn't that affect their sense of the world, of the, their picture of the world? Doesn't the remarkably high rate of all kinds of terrible social indicators among our young people um, indicate a massive loss of morale and hope in them? Uh, you know, I won't bombard you with statistics, but just a few suicides among Americans aged 10 to 24 increased by 60 percent between 2007 and 2018. That's before the pandemic. Uh, God only knows what those statistics are going to look like when we get updated ones. Uh, rates of depression, you know, alcohol abuse, drug abuse, etc. Youth mortality rates in the United States are twice that of Germany and France. You can go on and on. Um, now, I'm not saying bad history teaching is responsible for all of these things or bad civic education, but it's hard not to think that there's a connection. It, it's hard not to think that the morale of a nation being dependent on spirit uh, much more than it is on material concerns is something affected. By moving into the vacuum left, by the absence of a genuine civic and honest and uplifting civic education, along with the decline of traditional religion, the decay of family structures and other things that, that are going on and are not unrelated, the inglorious story has been gaining the upper hand. It's sustaining our low morale. It's saturating young people with debilitating ideas about their world, about the past, present, and future of their country, leaving them isolated and anxious. Um, an otherwise non-committal story in USA Today had this kind of unintentionally, uh, sadly hilarious sentence. Many children's experts say are struggling to imagine their futures. Well, duh. <laughs> Many children are struggling to imagine their future, and their parents are struggling to imagine their futures too. But this should not be a mystery to us. You know, the great Aust Austrian psychiatrist, Viktor Frankl, who was himself a concentration camp survivor, several, uh, two camps, I think, um, made the observation, humans can bear almost any kind of deprivation except the deprivation of meaning. Those with a reason to live, those with a task or goal toward which their striving can be directed, those who have a why that animates their lives, those who believe in the essential goodness of their country, of the regime under which they live, those can bear up under almost any hardship. But without that why, almost any how can defeat us. So here we are. This is, takes things a lot further than civics. Civics is more than civics. It's about uh, the, the moral character of ourselves as a nation. And properly understood, it involves the consideration of human nature itself. What are the best set of arrangements to cope with human nature as we find it? Not as we can imagine it being made to be, but as we find it. 
And it teaches us about our relationship to and indebtedness to the past and give us a sense of continuity with generations gone before. And doing that begins the process of one of the things that young people need to do, to locate your life in a meaning larger than <coughs> yourself. An approach to civics that's relentlessly pragmatic and present-minded and that fails to draw on our traditions of unifying symbols. And remember, the Constitution, I think, is central as a unifying symbol. That's going to fail to engender these things. It's going to serve to reinforce short-sightedness and self-absorption that we already have in abundance. I don't think we need any more of that. We need more of the other kind. Thank you all very much for your attention. 10 minutes for questions. I know uh, students have, uh, some have classes they need to get back to, but uh, we're also gonna hang out here for about a half hour. But do we have some uh, questions? We've got about 10 minutes. Many of us of a certain age have come through a series of generations where our grandparents were one level of society, our parents did better than they did. She's got my parents. And now we're looking at children and grandchildren. And they're faced with the inglorious education that we were spared. How do you see this turning around, what do you see needing to happen? Or do you see anything happening that's going to turn this around to where there's more places of education like what we're doing at Pepperdine in the grade schools, the junior highs, the high schools and colleges across the country? They're starting this stuff for the young. Yeah, I, oh, well, I mean, I think just mentioning Pepperdine and, and, uh, and the School of Public Policy as a start to an answer that we need to really hang on to and strengthen and be aware of the precariousness of the really good institutions in our society that are, that are, uh, that are resisting the inglorious story. Uh, uh, and uh, so, um, send money to Pete Peterson. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. standing by. Yeah, no. I, I think, in general, the principle that um, I think uh, we need alternative educational institutions, and that's happening. The burgeoning of the charter school movement, which I'm involved in yeah. at, at, at uh, Hillsdale, we have a charter school. Uh, 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 network and we uh, and I'm involved in several other charter school networks as an advisor and uh, this is great stuff and it's actually you know operating within the public school world but also non-public schools independent schools of various kind religious schools um, you know, classical schools classical Christian schools uh, Jewish day schools and all of these things are important and and uh, I think people. Look, we've seen, I see this in people I know who are generally sort of liberal in a, in, a, in a kind of humane way, and they certainly don't want to hurt anybody's feelings and that, that, that kind of thing. They've had it! They've had it! With, when it comes to educating their children um, in gender ideology, and the fight going on, in, was it Florida that has this, uh, you know, the, the fight is to, to um, uh, exclude mention of sexual orientation in K through third grade, yeah. and and the people are screaming about this is a terrible event. This people are not going to tolerate that. So um, the public education establishment is going to face a choice, and we need to make that choice really, really compelling for them. Do they want to? Do they want to go down this road, or, or they lose the constituency that they have? Um, uh, or, or are they going to change their ways? But I, I don't trust them to change their ways without strong countervailing forces. So I, I think alternative institutions um, and alternative sort resources. You know, the digital revolution is it's not an unmixed blessing, but if we if we use it properly, it can uh, it can be extraordinarily powerful. Um, we need to, and, and look, we have to get into popular culture and Hollywood, the media, and all of that. All of those things are forces moving in the wrong direction, and we need to, uh, we need to think about those things too. I, I don't know the first thing about Hollywood, but I know that 
that there are people who are trying to at least be a different voice there in, into our popular culture, and uh, I, I wish them well. Uh, so I, I think it's a it's a multi front. You know, we allowed we've allowed our culture to kind of get away from us, and people uh, have uh, they they but they've come to a point. Uh, parents, I mean, the Loudon uh, School, the San Francisco vote, you know, they, all of these things are signs that parents, even in very liberal places, have had it. Uh, and uh, if they have the voices and they have the stick to you have to get parents to care about it's something beyond their own children, which is often hard to do. You know, it's kind of like that. Okay, that's I'm done with that. That's not your problem. Uh, we have to get them to think in longer terms about that political activity. But yeah, I think running for school boards, all this kind of thing, has to be part of it. Yeah. Couple more, real briefly. Um, Eloquently done. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank you. Nicely done. Uh, my question is around, recently we've seen some folks from the, I'll call them the radical left, on various media, media platforms um, literally punching the Constitution between the eyes, saying that it is an old document needs to be completely replaced, refreshed. My question to you is, what is the best way, or what do you believe is the best way for us to uh, professionally and somehow fight back but not, obviously, we need to do it in such a way that it's, it's received by the public because there's more and more people that seem to be moving that direction and we need to stymie that. So I'm very concerned about the direction that's headed. So I'm interested in your take on that, that issue. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not at all complacent about that either. I mean, I think that, um, you know, when you have, um, I'm, th th there's a particular, I, uh, um, I don't know how much detail to go into about this, but, but I, I'm thinking of a particular professor at an Ivy League school who um, goes around saying this kind of thing, the Constitution's out there. And he never has anything to suggest by way of an alternative. Um, that's one of the things we can do, is sort of say, what's your alternative? Right. Uh, what, if, if due process is so onerous, <laughs> what's your substitute for it? Just let me have what I want, and you take the hindmost. I mean, it, 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 there's no principle there to be... You know, our principles are, are the ones that have a consistency and that, that um, you know, the, the, the sort of fundamental fairness that, you know, C.S. Lewis talks about this, about how children very early on uh, get into fights and they say, that's not fair. There's a way in which fairness has a kind of ground, uh, grounding in our natures. And uh, I think our understanding of uh, how you deliberate together, how you make uh, moral choices, uh, judicial choices, is is grounded in that. And uh, all, all, I think all, we just can't allow people to get away with these sort of shouted, um, peremptory, non-negotiable, I'm a part of a marginalized group, so I get to say this, and you can't uh, say anything back because to do so would we, you know, we can't accept that principle. That, that, that is just a, a, an ugly anti-intellectual principle that, that, um, that we've worked very hard at, to build a country that isn't, that isn't in chains to that. So uh, why should we accept it now? I would offer too, Bill, and you get into this in Land of Hope, and we certainly teach this in one of our core courses, Roots of American Order, is oftentimes these parts of history and documents like the Constitution are seen as things that were presented whole cloth as opposed to things that were yes. debated and deliberated over vigorously with people who really had opposing points of view. And so as you talk about in Land of Hope, the importance of studying the Constitution is certainly important to understand the document as it is and how it's relevant to today, but it's also important to see it as a platform over which people debated and discussed and argued to still come through to a final document that wasn't the least common denominator, it remains today the oldest con constitution in world history. And so. it's a very good point. I would also assert, as a last point, it's interesting to me that these folks don't understand by the very mere fact that they can articulate what they're articulating is protected by the Constitution. Mm -hmm. If that was not in place, you wouldn't be in a country where you could say anything because you'd be marched off to the next 
gulag and never seen again. So the Constitution yeah. is actually protecting these people being able to say that. So we've got time for one more question. Yes. Hi, thank you so much. Um, we're former teachers here, and, and I would like to know from you and the students who are here, at what age is it key to start targeting talking about the Constitution and the love of America. And if we're, you know, we baby boomers who've been successful want to put our money where our mouth is, you know, where should we be targeting? What age and what grade? And I'd like to hear, you know, what age was key for you to love America and, and to understand the Constitution and what, you know, what it stood for, it stands for? Well, I almost feel as if I should, you know, I'll try to be quick, uh, which is hard for me. <laughs> Um, look, I think that, that, of course, most states, the fifth, fifth grade is, fifth or sixth grade is when they start studying U.S. history. And, uh, I, think it, I think it can begin earlier than that. I think sometimes we are too abstract, and that professors are the worst, of course, but, uh, but we're too abstract in, I mean, in a way, what the Constitution is about is, is saying that, uh, that, that you, you, you know, you don't, um, even majorities don't necessarily rule. That there are there are principles that are that are undergird us, and find find ways with classroom activities to to make that real to people, to young people. I think is a so I can think you can start earlier than the fifth grade, but uh, I think one of the keys is that to find the right balance between teaching about abstract principles, but not being too abstract about it. Trying to find ways to, to uh, to make it vivid, to make it, and historical examples, of course, are, are plentiful. Uh, I try to do that in Land of Hope. I try to to bring out examples of why you know in our history so much of the constitutional give and take and to and fro. I've been talking too long already. I realize uh, is it plays out in events and not just in abstractions. So. It, it really helps. Kids need concrete things. They really do. Don't you think? I mean, we're starting to realize what we're up against. And we're more than capable of pushing it back. We shouldn't be discouraged about that. We just have to make up our mind to do it. What a great note to end yeah. on. Uh, we've, we've got to wrap up, but we are going to hang out here for a little bit. Um, I am delighted uh, to be able to have you back. This oh, thank you. It's such a it's great, great talk. Thank you. Thank you. And last, I want to thank again uh, Rosemary Licata. This has just been so great to be back together in person. And Rosemary, next year is going to be even better. So excited okay. about 2023. Uh, but please join me in thanking Rosemary. may have been told that this event is happening. If you're not on our email list, please uh, connect with Melissa Espinosa to make sure you're on the email list. I, in introducing Bill, he is the Victor Davis Hanson Chair at Hillsdale. I'm delighted to announce that our next major public event uh, will be with Victor Davis Hanson. Oh, wow. Not just the chair, but the whole person. <laughs> We got the chair, we got the person. Uh, that will be on April 28th in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, and, uh, so make sure that you're on the list for that, as that will uh, sell out. And so on that note, thank you all for joining us today. God bless.